Um, I think most of you know the format now. We're going to have a series of um, short uh, talks from the researchers, and then we will go to Q&A from the phones. We will start off um, with a brief introduction from Chris Gunter, who's a senior biology editor at Nature. Um, and then we've got Francis Collins, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH in the United States, followed by Mike Snyder, director for Yale Center for Genomics and Proteomics, um, and then conclusion by Ewan Burney, who is the head of the Genome um, Institute at the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, okay, Chris, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, I, uh, as Ruth mentioned, I'm a senior editor at Nature who handled this paper, and I just want everyone to uh, uh, thank everyone for being here today and also want to let you know that this paper will be freely available once it's published, uh, which is later today. It will also um, be freely available right when it's published, which is great for us. Uh, we're really honored to have this paper here. Um, I also want to let you know that there will be a web focus about this, which will have a number of links for people that are interested, including an archive of related papers. And this is at nature.com slash nature slash focus slash encode. So that is a resource that will be available to people afterwards. And if you have any questions during the day, um, you can let me know. I can um, direct you to the right people or whatever you need. Um, and now we're going to hear from Francis Collins. Well, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this press conference uh, revealing uh, some very exciting data that's come out of this project called ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute was the major supporter of this in terms of the funding, and we are elated uh, with the results that have come out of this in the way that it has annotated uh, in a really remarkably detailed way uh, the function of about 1% of the human genome and we aim, based upon that, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, to now scale this up in the not-too-distant future and apply these same approaches to the entire human genome, given the success of this pilot project. Sequencing the human genome, which was, of course, the major flagship goal of the human genome project, uh, succeeded in April 2003 in giving us the entire instruction manual for human biology. But it is written in a language that we are still trying to learn uh, how to understand. And in fact, what ENCODE is all about is exactly that, building an encyclopedia that helps us interpret the language of the human genome in a way that tells us what functions are encoded within this remarkable three billion uh, letter script. And that script, of course, written in this apparently simple alphabet with just four letters, but somehow carrying within it all of the instructions necessary to take a single-celled embryo and turn it into a very complex biological entity called a human being. So the encyclopedia before ENCODE was limited pretty much uh, to what we knew about the parts of the genome that code for protein, the, the exons. What we've learned through ENCODE, and you'll hear about this in much more detail from Mike and Ewan, is that, in fact, there's a lot more going on outside of those exons that's critical to function. Uh, this is, I think, therefore, a landmark in our understanding of human biology. I would point to a connection here that uh, might be relevant for today's uh, discussion. All of you who have been following what's happening in the field of genomics uh, will have noticed in the course of the last few months an outpouring of discoveries about genetic variations that are associated with common diseases like prostate cancer or diabetes or heart disease. And in fact, when you look at those discoveries, it is striking to notice that the vast majority of them do not appear to be due to variations in the exon, variations in the coding region of a gene. But in fact, they are, appear to be regulatory changes. ENCODE is, in fact, a very powerful tool now to begin to understand how those regulatory variants may affect function and confer risk of disease. So the fact that these projects have been proceeding in parallel, one understanding human variation, the other trying to understand genome function, is going to help us a lot in moving into this deeper uh, understanding of how, uh, how life works and how sometimes things go wrong and disease occurs. ENCODE is also a prime example of team science at its best. This paper being published in Nature today represents the joint efforts of 35 groups working together side by side from 80 organizations in 11 nations. And all of these groups agreed at the outset to share information, technologies, data, everything, and to get together as part of this consortium focused on this same carefully chosen 1% of the human genome. 
And I think that has worked re remarkably well. I think none of the data that came out of this would have been as rich as it is without the ability to cross compare between different groups and different technologies and see what you could learn when you intersect those kinds of uh, discoveries. Um, we are uh, delighted to have had a chance uh, to, to support this, but I, I think it's important to say that the success of this uh, now puts us in a position to scale this up. We spent $42 million on the pilot project that's being published today in Nature, uh, and now we are prepared, based upon what we've learned from that, uh, to go from 1% to the whole thing. And in fact, grants have already been solicited and received and are about to be reviewed, and we will make those awards by the end of September. You might wonder, if it costs $42 million to do 1%, how can we possibly afford to do the whole thing? Well, I'm happy to say that the experience that has come out of the pilot project has really helped us understand efficiencies of scale, and the technologies have advanced as a result. And so we believe that over the next four years, we can apply most of those same technologies with a rigorous approach towards data quality for less than a total of $100 million. So that tells you just how rapidly this has been progressing. And of course, all of the people who are working on other parts of the genome uh, and that didn't happen to be working in a place where ENCODE was uh, studying uh, the details are looking forward uh, to seeing the ENCODE project come to their town and to basically lay out the same rich detail of genome function that we now have uh, for this carefully chosen 30 megabases. So I just want to conclude by saying what a remarkably positive experience this has been in terms of scientific collaboration, and particularly to recognize the leadership of this project, people who basically put uh, their own uh, scientific efforts uh, very much into this collaborative work, uh, recognizing that the uh, output of this would be a collaborative paper occupying some 18 pages in nature, but feeling that the goals were so important that this was the right approach to take. And I think the results speak for themselves. I particularly want to thank you and Bernie, who will speak uh, in a few minutes, uh, who has led the analysis effort, uh, a very critical part of this. And one of the delightful aspects of this whole ENCODE project has been seeing how the experimentalists and the computational experts have really gotten together around a very explicit data set and learned a great deal from each other, really moving us into a new phase of computational biology. So I'm delighted to be part of this press conference, and I will be happy to answer questions when we get to that point. But now I would like to turn this over uh, to Mike Snyder uh, from Yale, who can tell you something about some of the experimental methods and some of the results. Okay, hi. Um, it's also a pleasure for me to participate in this conference and uh, uh, tell you my perspective on this. I think um, to echo some of Francis's comments, uh, understanding the human genome is not a simple process. It really required a diverse set of technologies and really a diverse set of researchers to be able to experimentally characterize the genome and then uh, analyze it with uh, the various analysis tools that you and Bernie will tell you about. And so what was done in this project was really to bring together this uh, very diverse set of tools to focus on 1% of the human genome. The 1% that was selected what involved some, uh, about half of it was areas of very high interest uh, uh, where there had been quite a bit of characterization already. And then the other half was uh, randomly selected regions that should be representative of the human genome. And uh, based on the, the amount of effort that was devoted to this, uh, the, this is an incredibly large project. And I would say the size and scale of a project for this type of work had never been uh, done before. And just to illustrate this point, over 400 million data points were generated uh, to be able to get the information that led to the maps that are essentially the, the product of this, 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 product, uh, this project. Um, so it required, as I say, the expertise of many, many different researchers uh, um, and many different groups. Um, over 35 different groups were involved, as Francis said. Now, a lot of the projects were really directed at trying to understand which regions of the genome uh, produce the information that ultimately leads to forming cells and forming a, a human body from a single cell. And these um, projects were largely devoted to try and understand uh, the, where the genes are, and, and genes, as many of you probably know, 
encode RNAs that actually transfer, that, that represent the information from the genes that ultimately gets used to form different cells and program uh, our developmental pathways. And what we really, one of the um, goals of this project and one of the things that came out was in fact understanding where all the different um, ex RNA expressed regions lie in the human genome and so where the various parts of genes are and get a better understanding of the protein coding genes and most important from that part is to try and understand exactly the, the RNAs they're making. And then also um, uh, to try and identify new genes um, and, and new sequences that are expressed as RNAs. And so one product was, in fact, to basically lay out this information of where um, the expressed regions lie in the human genome. I think another major emphasis was to try and understand where the regulatory sequences are that control the expressions of the genes so we can understand when the genes are expressed and which cell types, when and where, and also what happens when they get a, a barren expression occurs, such as in disease states. And so it's very important to map these regulatory sequences. They're very hard to find, and you need uh, comprehensive experimental tools to be able to find these things. And basically, a, a large effort was devoted to mapping these out. And, um, and we now have a much better understanding where a lot of the regulatory information lies. And, and certainly regions that were not um, known to encode functional uh, elements before, that is, they were thought to be junk DNA, it's now clear that some of this uh, um, encodes regulatory information. Um, a lot of the uh, um, uh, <coughs> projects, as I say, centered in those two areas. And just to give you an example of two of the highlights that came out of this project, one is our complexity of the, of the RNAs that are made is much, much higher than had been pre, uh, appreciated previously. So that is to say, I think we knew before that genes can often encode more than one RNA. And one product of this project was to discover that on average, each gene was making at least five different kinds of RNAs. And the complexity then is much, much higher than people had, had realized before. Another thing that was appreciated is that, as I say, we can map out many regulatory elements throughout the entire region. And um, <clears throat> one consequence of this is that we can now ha understand where some of the key regulatory regions lie. And there are elements called promoters that lie at the starts of genes. And we now, for example, have mapped out twice as many promoters as people had appre uh, appreciated previously, in fact, over twice as many. So what's happened is uh, I, um, we now have a much better map of all of the RNAs, the information that's expressed from the genome, and also where the regulatory sequences lie. And so we have a much better understanding of, of where these lie as a consequence of this. And in my view, I've, I envision this a lot like a sports car, what, analyzing the human genome is like looking at a sports car. When you first look at it, it looks pretty simple and elegant. But as soon as you start prodding around under the hood, you uh, realize exactly how complicated this is. It's, it's very complicated, uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun to actually try and sort this out. Now, one thing, a few other things emphasized that made this project possible. One is that a lot of the technologies that were used to uh, be able to analyze the human genome were all essentially invented over the last seven years or so. So this project probably could not have been carried out. Uh, in, in the previous century, it really had to be done in this one. And so there's been a lot of new experimental methods that were all brought to bear, and they've all been invented quite recently. Um, another big challenge is that because so many different researchers were involved generating different kinds of data, we really had to establish standards. And as Francis indicated, um, it required a big community effort to be able to um, uh, be able to compare data sets and work with this. And, and Ewan will probably talk about this further. But basically, um, what we needed were standards so that we could actually compare the results from the different groups and, and get them integrated so that they made a lot of sense. Um, it would be in, um, like uh, two different people uh, playing in a sports. If they didn't have the same rules, it would be a mess. And in this particular case, um, uh, we had to set the same rules so we could compare results and, and, and such. And so that's all I wanted to say at this point. Obviously, once all this data were generated, it required an incredibly intensive analysis, and that's actually the effort that Ewan has uh, very, very nicely led. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ewan. Okay, so thank you to, to Francis and Mike. I'm going to reiterate many of the points uh, previously made. And just to put myself in context, 
I'm really a computational person. I was, in fact, trained as a biochemist, but I am one of these um, computational people who was brought in, in some ways, to uh, to analyze the data. And there was a, a, a great uh, interdisciplinary team spanning many, many countries and spanning groups, some who generated the data and some who brought their own sort of statistical methods. And we went from physicists through to mathematicians to biologists in the um, the entire group. So I think the, the last kind of big experiment across the 1% of the genome was finished in early 2006. And uh, long before that last experiment was, uh, was completed, we established many uh, analysis groups that worked together. We met physically a number of times, but mainly this is done by, by email and phone conference. Um, and uh, over, over about two and a half years, we therefore analyzed this data in quite uh, a lot of depth. And uh, it is very daunting to get your head around this, this set of results. And I'm afraid part of that is just that we are complicated creatures. Although our genome is simple to write down, there are only four letters, we are complicated. And it's not surprising that the understanding of this is also a complicated uh, process. So what I'm going to give you now is this huge 10,000-mile uh, view of, uh, of what we discovered. And the main thing is that if you go back 10 years ago, when people first started sequencing the human genome, they were surprised at how, how little DNA was involved in protein coding regions. So only about 1.5% of the letters actually make proteins at the end of the day. And until that point, proteins were the main thing that people understood. And people rather dismissively called the rest of it junk DNA. Now, I think everybody who was in genomics knew that this stuff wasn't hanging around for the for the hell of it. Um, uh, and what the ENCODE project has really underlined is that the junk is not junk. It is very active. It does a lot of different things. And as Mike mentioned, one of the big surprises was that the junk, the, the regions, intergenic regions between genes, seems to be alive not only with regulatory regions, which we suspected, but also this transcription. There's a lot of transcription that happens across the genome, far more than we thought of previously. Now, um, there are now a myriad of little stories. And depending on your biological geekiness, you get excited about these stories at different levels. So some people genuinely get excited about the fact that, say, for example, for early replicating regions of the genome, uh, rather, sorry, late replicating regions of the genome, we have discovered a, a histone modification, which is histone 3 lysine 27 trimethylation that is correlated with that. Now, that excites, would you believe, some people in the biological community. I really doubt it's going to make front page news. Um, but it's one of those kind of details uh, in understanding that is, that is coming out from this process. But in making all of these detailed uh, investigations, we also uh, discovered a real conundrum. And the conundrum was the fact that we alongside this experimental uh, evidence on the human genome, we also generated the most in-depth mammalian, comparative mammalian sequence. So not only sequences from uh, genomes which we have genome-wide, such as mouse and rat, but some weird hedgehogs, uh, the platypus, the baboon, a bunch of other things were targeted. Uh, we got targeted sequence just across this 1%. And this allowed us to define the set of bases that are important for mammalian evolution, where uh, seemingly all mammals have needed this piece of genome to do something, and therefore it has resisted change over evolution. And the surprise was, was that many of the functional elements that we found on the genome were not conserved across mammals. And that was against our expectation going into the project. We expected maybe a little bit of things that were sort of human-specific, but for many of the regulatory elements, and even more for this RNA, we're finding between 50% to 70% of those functionally defined regions as not being conserved across mammals. Now, there's certain technical worries about what we're, whether there's some technical issue here. I will, bore, I will save you the details and, uh, and reassure you that this problem is not a technical problem. And then you can go, perhaps, so you, you have to have an explanation for what this, these additional experimental elements on the genome are doing that are not being used in other mammals. And one explanation is perhaps these are all the things that make humans humans. 
But to be honest, there's a lot of them, and that's against our, our sort of basic understanding of how common mammalian biology is. And it doesn't really fit with the diversity of different elements, many of which seem to be doing very basic, not merely mammalian biology things, but vertebrate biology things. And so we think quite a few of those are what's called neutral. That is that they appeared by chance over evolutionary time. So a sequence mutated to form a new structure that bound a protein uh, to this DNA sequence. Um, but that was neither to the organism's benefit nor to its hindrance. So uh, it just hung around uh, uh, for, for a while. I often think of these as kind of gate crashes in a party. Uh, and uh, they're just hanging around, taking the drinks, looking at the scenery, uh, and not necessarily you know, involving themselves uh, too much in the, in the business of a, of a meeting or something like that. And so it feels like we have quite a few of these gate crashes um, uh, that are hanging around uh, uh, over time. Um, and that aspect of many of these elements being neutral and not either um, uh, positively selected, that is important for the organism, nor in a negative selection, that is if you remove them, they, uh, they will cause the, the, the organism harm, is quite an interesting shift in perception uh, for many biologists as well. Now, we're not sure what the proportion is, how many bystanders there are versus how many people are doing, how, how many of these elements are doing very specific and important things. And this is more a, a question of speculation and taste at the moment, but it gives you an insight to what are the sort of new discoveries we're learning with this data. Now, even uh, one can get quite excited about the sort of new bits of biology one's trying to understand, but let me emphasize that the utility of this data is much more basic. It's about what Francis mentioned about regions of the genome that come out of uh, whole genome association studies due to genetic, um, uh, genetic risk factors. So here there may be an element that predisposes someone uh, for diabetes. One variant means that you're high risk for diabetes. Another variant means you're low risk. And as Francis mentioned, many of these regions are not occurring in protein coding regions. In fact, they're occurring out in these regions that people previously thought of as junk. Now, what we have now is a much an incredible catalog of elements uh, to be able to say, to be able to start to say, why is it that this part of the genome is changing the risk? And I think as ENCODE goes across the genome, we'll be providing researchers with a broader and broader set of annotations to understand how their biology, and in particular how disease biology, really uh, uh, happens, uh, and therefore hopefully get more insight into how to cure those. So I think I'll leave it there, and I guess it's back to you, Ruth. Thanks, Ewan. Um, and just an apology, I stumbled over Ewan's title. He is Head of Genome Annotation at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So um, now we'll go over to questions from the phones. Just a reminder to speakers, if you could say who is speaking when you answer a question, and also to the journalists on the lines, um, it, can't, it can be easier if you direct your question to a particular um, speaker. So, yeah, over to the questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press 7 on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw your question, please press 7 again. All questions will be asked in the order received, and you will be advised when to ask your question. The first question comes through from the line of Rich Weiss of the Washington Post. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you. I have, I have two questions. One is um, I'm wondering if the new revelations that sequence alone is only a small part of what makes uh, DNA behave as it does undermines the value of the relatively simple genetic tests that are now being produced to help people predict uh, disease and, uh, and recognize uh, you know, the therapeutic, uh, new therapeutic approaches to diseases. And secondly, I wonder if someone could address the question of what does this mean for the definition of the word gene? I think, Francis, you should take the first one, and I'm happy to take the second. Sure. Good morning, Rick. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the question you ask is a very interesting and appropriate one, basically reflecting the increasing recognition of the importance of epigenetics, that is, the things that modify the function of DNA but don't actually change its sequence. And in fact, ENCODE, as being published uh, today, 
is perhaps the most I insightful, detailed look we've had at epigenetic changes that affect DNA function. Many of the things reported in this paper, especially the ones that look at binding of uh, modified histones that basically determine whether a particular area of DNA is available for transcription or not. Uh, DNA's hypersensitive sites is another very uh, useful indicator of whether a particular part of the genome has an active functional role. All of those things are being cataloged by ENCODE on this 1% of the genome uh, in a much more uh, rich uh, uh, degree of detail than had previously been possible. But your question really was, well, what's the relevance of all that then uh, to genetic testing? I think if we're talking about a hereditary contribution to disease, while there may be a few examples, and they, you can count them on the fingers of one hand, I think, where epigenetic changes are proven to be heritable, where you have a DNA methylation change that predicts a disease which appears to have been passed through a family. There's a couple of instances of that, for instance, with colon cancer. And even there, there's some considerable skepticism about whether what one is being uh, what, what is being detected in terms of an epigenetic change of the DNA is actually reflective of some sequence change a little further away that got missed. So I think when it comes to hereditary predisposition to illness, DNA sequence is still going to be an extremely valuable window into that if we can build the catalog of information about which sequence changes are associated with which risks, and that's not going to go away. When it, when it comes to uh, a, another approach, as one might want to take, for instance, in assessing whether a particular tumor is going to be a bad actor or whether it's going to be relatively easily treated. Uh, then DNA sequence uh, will be very useful, but certainly we will want to be taking advantage of all of these epigenetic marks that tell you what's going on at the functional level. And of course, you can already see that happening uh, with some of the array studies that are used to tell whether a breast cancer, for instance, is going to need chemotherapy or not. Those are basically looking at gene expression. That, in turn, is an indication of the epigenetic state of the genome. And when you combine this, ultimately, with both an epigenetic look and a DNA sequence look, then I think you'd have the richest possible array of data for looking at something like cancer. But again, to come back to, I think, the fundamental question about whether DNA sequence data is going to be useful in the future, certainly for hereditary risk, it will remain the mainstay. And you had a second question. Yeah, about genes. So let me, uh, let me answer, let me uh, 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 try and take that one on. And I mean, the mic. Who's speaking? Uh, no, it's Ewan who's speaking. Okay. Yeah, it's you. Sorry, Ewan is speaking. Yeah. Um, this is one of those sort of Wittgenstein-like uh, questions about how one uses language. I, before molecular biology uh, was even invented, the word gene was around, and it made it meant something then, and that was about uh, about the way um, information was transmitted in what uh, was very discrete units as one monitored the information between generations. In the, the kind of revolution in the 70s of molecular biology, it was uh, quite impressive to see that that basic genetic uh, definition of the word gene matched seemingly a, a very um, clear-cut molecular biology definition about a set of RNA transcripts that are on a particular point of the genome. There may be multiple transcripts, but they're all localized in one place. Now, what we've done here, I think, and, and it's, there's a number of other papers that have supported this, is that that view of transcription is not really correct. Transcription looks like a much more complicated, intercalated, internetworked set of transcripts, some of which we had previously recognized as protein coding transcripts. Now, the fact that transcription is, is much more complicated, I don't think removes the concept of what a gene is. There's so still a really rather discrete unit um, that gets passed between from generation to generation and that evolution seems to care about. When we look at the way usually quite divergent species, this sort of concept of a, of a gene still seems to be a useful gene. What I think is going to change is that concept of a gene is going to have, is going to have less of a clear-cut correlation to the molecular biology. And so we'll just have to use our words carefully um, uh, and know when one's talking about transcripts and transcription and when one's talking about uh, what's always been a much looser concept, uh, uh, that of a gene. I hope Mike would agree with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's quite true. Thank you.
I would like, could I, if I could add something to Francis's comment, though, that I think what this project really does is it helps define, this is Mike Snyder speaking, um, what this project helped us do is help define the functional elements, which helps us zoom in on where to look for uh, differences in sequence that might relate to disease. So I think, I actually think this project helps us interpret the genome a lot better, and when combined with the sequence, it'll really further our, our, our ability to zoom in on the relevant regions that might be leading to disease. It's something yeah. Francis touched on, but I wanted, wanted to emphasize. I totally agree with that, and I think, again, what's likely now to happen with these discoveries about genetic variations in common disease are illustrative. Uh, when people report, as they have been doing in great profusion, uh, variations in the genome that clearly are predictive of a heightened risk of a disease like diabetes or breast cancer, Basically, you're identifying a sequence variation that somehow, some way, confers that risk. But to understand the functional elements of the genome through this encyclopedia is the critical step to try to make sense out of what is otherwise a statistical statement. We want to go from statistics to functional understanding. This is the way to do it. Thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Roger Highfield from the Daily Telegraph. Please go ahead with your question. Hi. Yeah, it's um, uh, we've had all these studies, uh, genome-wide studies, coming out in the last couple of months, um, which, as you said in the uh, sort of preamble, uh, some of them are, are linking to these regulatory um, regions that we used to write off as junk. The fact that they don't um, code, don't link to uh, coding regions. Do you think that's going to set back efforts to turn? understanding of these um, uh, genetic linkages into treatments. So this Francis Collins, let me uh, take a whack at that and uh, see if others want to add. Um, I don't think this is particularly surprising. We expected that variations that play a role in common disease would be relatively subtle. These were not expected to be knockout blows uh, sustained by genes as you might expect to find, for instance, in a highly heritable condition like cystic fibrosis. We expected these would be subtle changes that altered the function of the gene a bit, enough to confer a heightened risk, but not a certainty by any means of illness. And I think there was a debate until we had the data about whether those would be subtle changes in the coding region or subtle changes outside the coding region. And clearly, as the uh, data is pouring in, it looks as if the majority of them are going to be outside the coding region and in the regulatory regions. Now, what that means for treatment, I think, is hard to predict. One can imagine that this could actually be a good thing, because it would tell you that there's a subtle tweaking of the expression of that particular gene and therefore that particular protein in a person at higher risk. They're making a little too much or not quite enough, and the ability to compensate for that by providing a drug, a small molecule, uh, is certainly something one could approach uh, with some enthusiasm of the likelihood of success. Uh, you could contrast that with perhaps a circumstance where the finding in a particular disease is that the protein being made is toxic in some way, and that might be more difficult in some ways uh, to try to compensate for. Uh, what it does mean, and I, I think this is a serious part of it, it's going to take us a little longer, perhaps, uh, to sort out exactly what is the mechanism of disease risk for those situations where uh, the causative variation is not in the coding region but somewhere nearby, because we'll have some work to do to figure out exactly how that works and what is the consequences. The gene expressed too high, too low, in the wrong tissue, at the wrong time, what's the actual detail here that a drug would need to compensate for? But that can get sorted out, and once it has been, I think it is not clear to me that the pathway towards therapeutics is going to be particularly altered in terms of the time required, depending on whether it's a regulatory or a coding change. Actually, could I just ask one little follow-up? Uh, I remember famously when you unravel, when you unveiled the genome in the White House, you you likened it to an occasion of worship, and you said it was humbling and awe-inspiring to look at something that was only known to God. Um, Francis, why did God make it so? awfully complicated. <laughs> well, I think we are intended to be complicated, and we obviously are. And I think you can't imagine a circumstance where a one-dimensional script of three billion letters would be sufficient to generate the kind of awesome complexity 
of a human being without a great deal of elaborate regulatory network uh, being uh, operating upon this instruction book. So I don't think it is. Uh, it should be considered surprising at all that what we have uncovered is in fact complex, and uh, I think we all are, from whatever our philosophical perspective, rather awed by what we're seeing, perhaps a little daunted by the complexity of trying to understand it, but also I think feeling really fortunate uh, to be here at this point in history uh, looking for the first time at some of this amazing complexity of how the human genome works. Thanks very much. Thank you. The next question comes through from the line of John Lowerman from Bloomberg News. Please go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, so uh, two questions. Does this term now, or is there some DNA that, uh, that we still can call junk? And then I have a second question, which I can wait I, to I, give. Or you, you got cut off. I couldn't yeah. hear. You, okay. We missed the first part of the question. Okay, so the first first question is: Does this mean that there is no such thing as junk DNA? Can is the, is the term junk DNA junk itself? Can we just get rid of that term? And then I have a second question, which I can give later or give now. Okay. Well, I I never. This is you and Bernie. I never liked the word junk uh, for for DNA. It's it's a very uh, dismissive tone of something that we don't we just we just basically didn't understand. I still think there's a there's a class of DNA which um, let's use a which definitely looks like it's parasitic. Mm -hmm. These are these repeat elements, and uh, in different genomes they've had an awful lot of fun copying themselves around and about. Now, as parasites sometimes do, perhaps some of them are useful. There's a nice little uh, sort of side story there about uh, about whether whether they've actually uh, uh, helped us out. But there's certainly a, a class of elements that biology relatively well understands, which um, which is is uh, parasitic and, and and copied multiple times. The rest of the genome, I just I just don't find the word junk very useful, and uh, and and for the rest of it, I I don't think it is useful to 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 talk about junk. What I do think is is something to think about. Is this concept of sort of bystanders about bits that sort of uh, are on for the ride, uh, are just sort of hanging out at the moment, um, but in some sense may become useful in the future if we sort of run evolution forwards a couple of million years, then maybe that that region of the sequence may become useful, and um, that concept of neutrality, which has been around for for a while for about the way proteins evolve, is I think a new idea. Um, in about uh, a more general thing about how these different elements uh, do appear and disappear. So I guess here's my here's, here's can I just uh, get uh, ask for clarification yeah. here. So if, if what percentage of the genome would you say that we now think is actively involved in making a human being uh, compared to what we thought before? I don't think we know the answer to that yeah, still. There's still a lot more work to be done. This is Mike Snyder speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, I, I mean, it's clear that 5% um, of the genome is constrained, meaning uh, that it, it cannot evolve. So w one could use that as a number, but I, I don't think we really know for sure. Again, 1.5% encodes protein. A certain fraction encodes regulatory elements. We have not mapped all of the regulatory elements yet in the human genome. This is, a, I think, a great first start, but there's still much more to be done. And we don't know, although there's a lot of these new transcribed regions and new RNAs that are appearing, we still don't know exactly what those do, whether they have a function or not, uh, and whether they are contributing. So that it's, still, it's still not clear. There's still a lot more to be learned. Yeah, this, Francis Collins, let me try an analogy on you. I think the point that Ewan made both in his prepared remarks and in the answer to this question is a really critical one, maybe one of the most surprising fundamental findings of this paper, namely that there is a lot of biological activity going on uh, in the human genome for which we cannot show evolutionary evidence for constraint, suggesting that this is, in fact, sort of like clutter in the attic, it's not the kind of clutter that you would get rid of without consequences, because you might need it. And if natural selection comes along and needs to operate on something, you're much better off if you've got clutter in your attic than if it's spick and span. 
<laughs> but then we come to a definitional question. I, I think what you could say is that most of the time the human genome is operating on the first and second floor uh, with maybe 5% of the genome doing whatever needs to be done in terms of daily activities. But over evolutionary time, a much larger fraction of the genome, the stuff that's up in the attic, uh, becomes important, is probably responsible for the fact that got us to where we are in terms of complexity, and is still there, waiting for natural selection, perhaps, uh, to call upon it. Okay. And my second question is, does this um, mean, uh, you know, over the years we've seen, you know, various comparisons of um, humans, uh, uh, you know, from one human to another, and, and the amount of uh, genetic similarity uh, among humans, as well as the genetic similarity uh, between uh, humans and uh, non-humans. And I'm wondering, does this change any of that? Does this mean that, in fact, we're much more varied from one person to another? Is that is that a possibility? Um, I mean, this is this is you and Bernie here. I, uh, as part of being head of sort of genome annotation, I, uh, I kind of look after many, many um, species at the EBI, a whole range of little beasties from chickens through sea squirts and other things. The striking thing about humans is how similar we are. We are mm -hmm. remarkably similar compared mm -hmm. to nearly any other sort of species that you go out and look at. We are incredibly similar. And not only do we, are we incredibly similar, but to be honest, I, I, it's my opinion that the only sensible way to view our genetics is of one population. Mm -hmm. Although um, we, there are certain aspects of that where we, we pick up on, on certain things that we feel are important, such as skin color. When you actually go back and you look at the genetics, these, these distinctions are not useful distinctions to understand the genetics. As a, as a, as a, as a kind of the way we think about uh, the species, we just seem to be one population. Now, that said, it is the case that these new regulatory elements show more diversity than the protein coding genes. That is, that, that either because they genuinely contribute to more of the, the sort of functional differences between individuals, um, or because many of them are perhaps this, this, these bystanders, the clutter in the attic, it doesn't matter that they're, so di that, that they're, as they're more diverse than the bits the ground floor, in France's analogy, has to be quite locked down, and the, the, you can change your attic without sort of much consequence. Um, uh, but that has to be seen in the context, even though these are the regions which show more diversity, that's got to be seen in the context of a remarkably little amount of diversity across us as a whole species. And uh, uh, us as a, as a population, we really do, I think, look like one population far more than we look like uh, separate populations. And that's sometimes hard to get your head around, um, but that's the way the data is. So, so no increase really, no no change in the amount of genetic diversity between, say, one human being and the next. Not, uh, not it, really. I mean, I mean, just to say that that where where we do we do see these regulatory regions showing more diversity, but I don't, I wouldn't want to interpret that in some strong, strong implication about what what the differences between individuals are. And, and any times we talk about the differences between individuals, I think the thing to absolutely stress is that we are far, far, far more similar to each other than uh, than we are different. And um, uh, you, you know, you should meet a sea squirt uh, to really understand what difference between individuals mean. <laughs> that that's a whole new uh, whole new world out there. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further questions. Just a reminder: if you would like to ask a question please press 7 on your telephone keypad. Okay. We have right, no guys. further questions from the phone. Okay, great. So thanks ever so much for dialing in, and a big thank you to all the speakers. Just a final reminder that the embargo on this is 6 p.m. London time, 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern time today. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.